2025, Intelligence is Ongoing, Individual Adaptability, Adaptations that an intelligent species may make in a single generation, other species make over many generations of selective breeding and selective dying. Yet intelligence is demanding. If it is misdirected by accident or by intent, it can foster its own orgies of breeding and dying. Earthseed, the books of the living. Four, a victim of God may, through learning adaption, become a partner of God. A victim of God may, through forethought and planning, become a shaper of God. Or a victim of God may, through short-sightedness and fear, remain God's victim, God's plaything, God's prey. Earthseed, the books of the living. Saturday, February 1st, 2025. We had a fire today. People worry so much about fire, but the little kids will play with it if they can. We were lucky with this fire. Amy Dunn, three years old, managed to start it in her family's garage. Once the fire began to crawl up the wall, Amy got scared and ran into the house. She knew she had done something bad, so she didn't tell anyone. She hid under her grandmother's bed. Out back, the dry wood of the garage burned fast and hot. Robin Bader saw the smoke and rang the emergency bell on the island in our street. Robin's only 10, but she's a bright little kid. One of my stepmother's star students. She keeps her head. If she hadn't alerted people as soon as she saw the smoke, the fire could have spread. I heard the bell and ran out like everyone else to see what was wrong. The Duns live across the street from us, so I couldn't miss the smoke. The fire plan worked the way it was supposed to. The adult men and women put the fire out with garden hoses, shovels, wet towels, and blankets. Those without hoses beat at the edges of the fire and smothered them with dirt. Kids my age helped out where we were needed and put out any new fires started by flying embers. We brought buckets to fill with water and shovels, blankets, and towels of our own. There were a lot of us, and we kept our eyes open. The very old people watched the little kids and kept them out of the way and out of trouble. No one missed Amy. No one had seen her in the Dunn backyard, so no one thought about her. Her grandmother found her much later and got the truth out of her. The garage was a total loss. Edwin Dunn salvaged some of his garden and carpentry equipment, but not much. The grapefruit tree next to the garage and the two peach trees behind it were, very, were half burned too, but they might survive. The carrot, squash, collard, and potato plants were a trampled mess. Of course, no one called the fire department. No one would take on fire service fees just to save an unoccupied garage. Most of our households couldn't afford another big bill anyway. The water wasted on putting out the fire was going to be hard enough to pay for. What will happen, I wonder, to poor little Amy Dunn? No one cares about her. Her family feeds her and now and then cleans her up, but they don't love her or even like her. Her mother, Tracy, is only a year older than I am. She was 13 when Amy was born. She was 12 when her 27-year-old uncle, who had been raping her for years, managed to make her pregnant. Problem. Uncle Derek was a big, blonde, handsome guy, funny and bright and well-liked. Tracy was, is, dull and homely, sulky and dirty looking. Even when she's clean, she looks splotchy, dirty. Some of her problems might have come from being raped by Uncle Dirk, Derek for years. Uncle Derek was Tracy's mother's youngest brother, her favorite brother. But when people realized what he had been doing, the neighborhood men got together and suggested he go live somewhere else. People didn't want him around their daughters. Irrational as usual, Tracy's mother blamed Tracy for his exile and for her own embarrassment. Not many girls in the neighborhood have babies before they drag some boy to my father and have him unite them in holy matrimony. But there was no one to marry Tracy and no money for prenatal care or an abortion. And poor Amy, as she grew, looked more and more like Tracy, scrawny and splotchy with sparse stringy hair. I don't think she'll ever be pretty. Tracy's maternal instincts didn't kick in and I doubt that her mother Christmas Dunn has any. The Dunn family has a reputation for craziness. 
There are 16 of them living in the Dunn house, and at least a third are nuts. Amy isn't crazy, though. Not yet. She's neglected and lonely, and like any little kid left on her own too much, she finds ways to amuse herself. I've never seen anyone hit Amy or curse her or anything like that. The Duns do care what people think of them, but no one pays any attention to her either. She spends most of her time playing alone in the dirt. She also eats the dirt and whatever she finds in it, including bugs. But not long ago, just out of curiosity, I took her to our house, sponged her off, taught her the alphabet, and showed her how to write her name. She loved it. She's got a hungry, able little mind, and she loves attention. Tonight, I asked Corey if Amy could start school early. Corey doesn't take kids until they're five, or close to five, but she said she'd let Amy in if I would take charge of her. I expected that, though I don't like it. I help with the five and six-year-olds anyway. I've been taking care of little kids since I was one, and I'm tired of it. I think, though, that if someone doesn't help Amy now, someday she'll do something a lot worse than burning down her family's garage. Wednesday, February 19th, 2025. Some cousins of old Mrs. Sims have inherited her house. They're lucky there's still a house to inherit. If it weren't for our wall, the house would have been gutted, taken over by squatters, or torched as soon as it was empty. As it was, all people did was take back things they had given to Mrs. Sims after she was robbed and take whatever food she had in the house. No sense letting it rot. We didn't take her furniture or her rugs or her appliances. We could have, but we didn't. We aren't thieves. Wardale Parrish and Rosalie Payne think otherwise. They're both small, rust brown, sour looking people like Mrs. Sims. They're the children of a first cousin that Mrs. Sims had managed to keep contact and good relations with. He's a widower, twice over, no kids, and she's been widowed once, seven kids. They're not only brother and sister, but twins. Maybe that helps them get along with each other. They damn sure won't get along with anyone else. They're moving in today. They've been here a couple of times before to look the place over, and I guess they must have liked it better than their parents' house. They shared that with 18 other people. I was busy in the den with my class of younger school kids, so I didn't meet them until today, though I've heard dad talking to them, heard them sit in our living room and insinuate that we had cleaned out Mrs. Sims' house before they had arrived. Dad kept his temper. You know she was robbed during the month before she died, he said. You can check with the police about that if you haven't already. Since then, the community has protected the house. We haven't used it or stripped it. If you choose to live among us, you should understand that. We help each other, and we don't steal. I wouldn't expect you to say you did, Wardell Parrish muttered. His sister jumped in before he could say more. We're not accusing anyone of anything, she lied. We just wondered. We knew Cousin Marjorie had some nice things, jewelry that she inherited from her mother. Very valuable. Check with the police, my father said. Well, yes, I know, but this is a small community, my father said. We all know each other here. We depend on each other. There was a silence. Perhaps the twins were getting the message. We're not very social, Wardell Parrish said. We mind our own business. Again, his sister jumped in before he could go on. I'm sure everything will be all right, she said. I'm sure we'll get along fine. I didn't like them when I heard them. I liked them even less when I met them. They look at us as though we smell and they don't. Of course, it doesn't matter whether I like them or not. There are other people in the neighborhood whom I don't like, but I don't trust the pain parishes. The kids seem all right, but the adults, I wouldn't want to have to depend on them, not even for little things. Pain and Parish, what perfect names they have. Saturday, February 22nd, 2025. We ran into a pack of feral dogs today. We went to the hills today for target practice. Me, my father, Joanne Garfield, her cousin and boyfriend, Harold, Harry Bader, my boyfriend, Curtis Talcott, his brother, Michael, Aura Moss, and her brother, Peter. Our other adult guardian was Joanne's father, Jay. He's a good guy and a good shot. Dad likes to work with him, although sometimes there are problems. The Garfields and the Baders are white and the rest of us are black. That can be dangerous these days. On the street, people are expected to fear and hate everyone but their own kind. 
but with all of us armed and watchful, people stared, but they let us alone. Our neighborhood is too small for us to play those kinds of games. Everything went as usual at first. The Talcas got into an argument first with each other, then with the Mosses. The Mosses are always blaming other people for whatever they do wrong, so they tend to have disputes outstanding with most of us. Peter Moss is the worst because he's always trying to be like his father, and his father is a total shit. His father has three wives, all at once, Karen, Natalie, and Zara. They've all got kids by him, though so far, Zara, the youngest and prettiest, only has one. Karen is the one with the marriage license, but she let him get away with bringing in first one, then another new woman into the house and calling them his wives. I guess the way things are, she didn't think she could make it on her own with three kids when he brought in Natalie and by and five by the time he found Zara. The Mosses don't come to church. Richard Moss has put together his own religion, a combination of the Old Testament and historical West African practices. He claims that God wants men to be patriarchs, rulers, and protectors of women and fathers of as many children as possible. He's an engineer for one of the big commercial water companies, so he can afford to pick up beautiful young homeless women and live with them in polygamous relationships. He could pick up 20 women like that if he could afford to feed them. I hear there's a lot of that kind of thing going on in other neighborhoods. Some middle-class men prove their men by having a lot of wives and temporary or permanent relationships. Some upper-class men prove their men by having one wife and a lot of beautiful, disposable young servant girls. Nasty. When the girls get pregnant, if their rich employers won't protect them, the employer's wives throw them out to starve. Is that the way it's going to be, I wonder? Is that the future? Large numbers of people stuck in either President-elect Donner's version of slavery or Richard Moss's. We rode our bikes to the top of River Street past the last neighborhood walls, past the last ragged, unwalled houses, past the last stretch of broken asphalt and rag and stick shacks of squatters and street poor who stare at us in their horrible, empty way, and then higher into the hills along a dirt road. At last we dismounted and walked our bikes down a narrow trail into one of the canyons that we and others use for target practice. It looked all right this time, but we always have to be careful. People use cannons for a lot of things. If we find corpses in one, we stay away from it for a while. Dad tries to shield us from what goes on in the world, but he can't. Knowing that, he also tries to teach us to shield ourselves. Most of us have practiced at home with BB guns, on homemade targets, or on squirrel and bird targets. I've done all that. My aim is good, but I don't like it with the birds and squirrels. Dad was the one who insisted on my learning to shoot them. He said, moving targets would be good for my aim. I think there was more to it than that. I think he wanted to see whether or not I could do it, whether shooting a bird or a squirrel would trigger my hyper empathy. It didn't, quite. I didn't like it, but it wasn't painful. It felt like a big, soft, strange ghost blow, like getting hit with a huge ball of air, but with no coolness or no feeling of wind. The blow, though still soft, was a little harder with squirrels and sometimes rats than with birds. All three had to be killed, though. They ate our food or ruined it. Tree crops were their special victims. Peaches, plums, figs, persimmons, nuts. And crops like strawberries, blackberries, grapes, whatever we planted, if they could get at it, they would. Birds are particular pests because they can fly in, yet I like them. I envy their ability to fly. Sometimes I get up and go out at dawn just so I can watch them without anyone scaring them or shooting them. Now that I'm old enough to go target shooting on Saturdays, I don't intend to shoot any more birds, no matter what dad says. Besides, just because I can shoot a bird or a squirrel doesn't mean I could shoot a person, a thief like the ones who robbed Mrs. Sims. I don't know whether I could do that. And if I did it, I don't know what would happen to me. Would I die? It's my father's fault that we pay so much attention to guns and shooting. He carries a 9mm automatic pistol whenever he leaves the neighborhood. He carries it on his hip where people can see it. He says that discourages mistakes. Armed people do get killed, most often in crossfires or by snipers, but unarmed people get killed a lot more often. Dad also has a silenced 9mm submachine gun. 
and stays at home with Corey in case something happens there while he's away. Both guns are German, Heckler and Koch. Dad has never said where he got the submachine gun. It's illegal, of course, so I don't blame him. It must have cost a hell of a lot. He's only had it away from home a few times, so he, Corey, and I could get the feel of it. He'll do the same for the boys when they're older. Corey has an old Smith & Wesson 38 revolver that she's good with. She's had it since before she married Dad. She loaned that one to me today. Ours aren't the best or the newest guns in the neighborhood, but they all work. Dad and Corey keep them in good condition. I have to help with that now. And they spend the necessary time on practice and money on ammunition. At neighborhood association meetings, Dad used to push the adults of every household to own weapons, maintain them, and know how to use them. Know how to use them so well, he said more than once, that you're as able to defend yourself at 2 a.m. as you are at 2 p.m. At first, there were a few neighbors who didn't like that older ones who said it was the job of the police to protect them, younger ones who worried that their little children would find their guns, and religious ones who didn't think a minister of the gospel should need guns. This was several years ago. The police, my father told them, may be able to avenge you, but they can't protect you. Things are getting worse. And as for your children, well, yes, there is risk, but you can put your guns out of their reach while they're very young and train them as they grow older. That's what I mean to do. I believe they'll have a better chance of growing up if you can protect them. He paused, stared at the people, then went on. I have a wife and five children, he said. I will pray for them all. I'll also see to it that they know how to defend themselves. And for as long as I can, I will stand between my family and any intruder. He paused again. Now that's what I have to do. You all do what you have to do. By now, there are at least two guns in every household. Dad says he suspects that some of them are so well hidden, like Mrs. Sims' gun, that they wouldn't be available in any emergency. He's working on that. All the kids who attend school at our house get gun handling instruction. Once they've passed that and turned 15, two or three of the neighborhood adults begin taking them to the hills for target practice. It's a kind of rite of passage for us. My brother Keith has been whining to go along whenever someone gets a shooting group together, but the age rule is firm. I worry about the way Keith wants to get his hands on the guns. Dad doesn't seem to worry, but I do. There are always a few groups of homeless people and packs of feral dogs living out beyond the last hillside shacks. People and dogs hunt rabbits, possums, squirrels, and each other. Both scavenge whatever dies. The dogs used to belong to people or their ancestors did, but dogs eat meat. These days, no poor or middle-class person who had an edible piece of meat would give it to a dog. Rich people still keep dogs either because they like them or because they use them to guard estates, enclaves, and businesses. The rich have plenty of other security devices, but the dogs are extra insurance. Dogs scare people. I did some shooting today and I was leaning against a boulder watching others shoot when I realized there was a dog nearby watching me. Just one dog, male, yellow brown, sharp eyed, short haired. He wasn't big enough to make a meal of me and I still had the Smith and Wesson. So while he was looking me over, I took a good look at him. He was lean, but he didn't look starved. He looked alert and curious. He sniffed the air and I remembered that dogs were supposed to be oriented more towards scent than sight. Look at that, I said to Joanne Garfield, who was standing nearby. She turned, gasped, and jerked her gun up to aim at the dog. The dog vanished into the dry brush and boulders. Turning, Joanne tried to look elsewhere as though she expected to see more dogs stalking us, but there was nothing. She was shaking. I'm sorry, I said. I didn't know you were afraid of them. She drew a deep breath and looked at the place where the dog had been. I didn't know I was either, she whispered. I've never been so close to one before. I, I wish I had gotten a better look at it. At that moment, Aura Moss screamed and fired her father's llama automatic. I pushed away from the boulder and turned to see Aura pointing her gun towards some rocks and babbling. It was over there, she said, her words tumbling over one shoulder. It was some kind of animal, dirty yellow with big teeth. It had its mouth open. It was huge. 
You stupid bitch, you almost shot me, Michael Talcott shouted. I could see now that he had ducked down behind a boulder. He would have been in Aura's line of fire, but he didn't seem to be hurt. Put your gun, gun away, Aura, my father said. He kept his voice low, but he was angry. I could see that, whether Aura could or not. It was an animal, she insisted, a big one. It might still be around. Aura, my father raised his voice and heartened it. Aura looked at him, then seemed to realize that she had more than a dog to worry about. She looked at the gun in her hand, frowned, fumbled it safe, and put it back into her holster. Mike, my father said. I'm okay. Michael Talcott said, no thanks to her. It wasn't my fault, Aura said, right on cue. There was an animal. It could have killed you. It was sneaking up on us. I think it was just a dog, I said. There was one watching us over here. Joanne moved and it ran away. You should have killed it, Peter Ma said. What do you want to do? Wait until it jumps someone? What was it doing, Jay Garfield asked. Just watching? That's all, I said. It didn't look sick or starved. It wasn't very big. I don't think it was a danger to anyone here. There are too many of us, and we're all too big. The thing I saw was huge, Aura insisted. It had his mouth open. I went over to her because I had had a sudden thought. It was panting, I said. They pant when they're hot. It doesn't mean they're angry or hungry. I hesitated, watching her. You've never seen one before, have you? She shook her head. They're bold, but they're not dangerous to a group like this. You don't have to worry. She didn't look as though she quite believed me, but she seemed to relax a little. The Moss girls were both bullied and sheltered. They were almost never allowed to leave the walls of the neighborhood. They were educated at home by their mothers according to the religion their father had assembled, and they were warned away from the sin and contamination of the rest of the world. I'm surprised that Aura was allowed to come to us for gun handling instruction and target practice. I hope it will be good for her, and I hope the rest of us will survive. All of you stay where you are, Dad said. He glanced at Jay Garfield. They went a short way up among the rocks and scrub oaks to see whether Aura had shot anything. He kept his gun in his hand and the safety off. He was out of our sight for no more than a minute. He came back with a look on his face that I couldn't read. Put your guns away, he said. We're going home. Did I kill it? Aura demanded. No, get your bikes. He and Jay Garfield whispered together for a moment and Jay Garfield sighed. Joanne and I watched them, wondering, knowing we wouldn't hear anything from them until they were ready to tell us. This is not about a dead dog, Harold Bader said behind us. Joanne moved back to stand beside him. It's about either a dog pack or a human pack, I said, or maybe it's a corpse. It was, as I found out later, a family of corpses, a woman, a little boy of about four years, and a just born infant, all partially eaten. But dad didn't tell me that until we got home. At the canyon, all we knew was that he was upset. If there were a corpse around here, we would have smelled it, Harry said. Not if it were fresh, I countered. Joanne looked at me and sighed the way her father sighs. If it's that, I wonder where we'll go shooting next time. I wonder when there'll be a next time. Peter Moss and the Talker brothers had gotten into an argument over whose fault it was that Aura had almost shot Michael and dad had to break it up. Then dad checked with Aura to see that she was all right. He said a few things to her that I couldn't hear and I saw a tear slide down her face. She cries easily. She always has. Dad walked away from her looking harassed. He led us the, up the path out of the canyon. He walked, we walked our bikes and we all kept looking around. We could see now that there were other dogs nearby. We were being watched by a big pack. Jay Garfield brought up the rear, guarding our backs. He said we should stick together, Joanne told me. She had seen me looking back at, our fa at her father. You and I? Yeah, and Harry. He said we should look out for one another. I don't think these dogs are stupid enough or hungry enough to attack us in daylight. They'll go after some lone street person tonight. Shut up, for God's sake. The road was narrow going up and out of the canyon. It would have been a bad place to fight, to have to fight off dogs. Someone could trip and step off the crumbling edge. Someone could be knocked off the edge by a dog or by one of us. That would mean falling several hundred feet. Down below, I could hear dogs fighting now. We may have been close to their dens or whatever they lived in. I thought maybe we were just close to what they were feeding on. If they come, my father said in a quiet, even voice, 
Freeze, aim, and fire. That will save you. Nothing else will. Freeze, aim, and fire. Keep your eyes open and stay calm. I replayed the words in my mind as we went up the switchbacks. No doubt dad wanted us to replay them. I could see that Aura was still leaking tears and smearing and streaking her face with dirt like a little kid. She was too wrapped up in her own misery and fear to be of much use. We got almost to the top before anything happened. We were beginning to relax, I think. I hadn't seen a dog for a while. Then from the front of our line, we heard three shots. We all froze, most of us unable to see what had happened. Keep moving, my father called. It's all right. It was just one dog getting too close. Are you okay? I called. Yes, he said. Just come on and keep your eyes open. One by one, we came abreast of the dog that had been shot and walked past it. It was a bigger, grayer animal than the one I had seen. There was a beauty to it. It looked like pictures I had seen of wolves. It was wedged against a hanging boulder just a few steps up the steep canyon wall from us. It moved. I saw its bloody wounds as it twisted. I bit my tongue as the pain I knew it must feel became my pain. What to do? Keep walking? I couldn't. One more step and I would fall and lie in line the dirt, helpless against the pain, or I might fall into the canyon. It's still alive, Joanne said behind me. It's moving. Its forefeet were making little running motions, its claws scraping against the rock. I thought I would throw up. My belly hurt more and more until I felt skewered through the middle. I leaned on my bike with my left arm. With my right hand, I drew the Smith & Wesson, aimed, and shot the beautiful dog through his head. I felt the impact of the bullet as a hard, solid blow, something beyond pain. Then I felt the dog die. I saw it jerk, shudder, stretch its body long, then freeze. I saw it die. I felt it die. It went out like a match in a sudden vanishing of pain. Its life flared up, then went out. I went a little numb. Without the bike, I would have collapsed. People have crowded close before and behind me. I heard them before I could see them clearly. It's dead, I heard Joanne say. Poor thing. What? My father demanded. Another one? I managed to focus on him. He must have skirted close to the cliff edge of the road to have gotten all the way back to us, and he must have run. The same one, I said, managing to straighten up. It wasn't dead. We saw it moving. I put three bullets into it, he said. It was moving, Reverend Olamina, Joanne insisted. It was suffering. If Lauren hadn't shot it, someone else would have had to. Dad sighed. Well, it isn't suffering now. Let's get out of here. Then he seemed to realize what Joanne had said. He looked at me. Are you all right? I nodded. I don't know how I looked. No one was reacting to me as though I looked odd, so I must not have shown much of what I had gone through. I think only Harry Bader, Chris, Curtis, Talcott, and Joanne had seen me shoot the dog. I looked at them and Curtis grinned at me. He leaned against his bike and in a slow, lazy motion, he drew an imaginary gun, took careful aim at the dead dog, and fired an imaginary shot. Pow, he said, just like she does stuff like that every day. Pow. Let's go, my father said. We began walking up the path again. We left the canyon and made our way down to the street. There were no more dogs. I walked, then rode in a daze, still not quite free of the dog I had killed. I had felt it die, and yet I had not died. I had felt its pain as though it were a human being. I had felt its life flare and go out, and I was still alive. Pow. Five. Belief. Initiates and guides action, or it does nothing. Earth Seed, The Books of the Living. Sunday, March 2nd, 2025. It's raining. We heard last night on the radio that there was a storm sweeping in from the Pacific, but most people don't believe it. We'll have wind, Corey said. Wind and maybe a few drops of rain, or maybe just a little cool weather. That would be welcome. It's all we'll get. That's all there has been for six years. I can remember the rain six years ago, water swirling around the back porch, not high enough to come into the house, but high enough to attract my brothers who wanted to play in it. Corey, forever worried about infection, wouldn't let them. She said they'd be splashing around in the soup of all the wastewater germs we'd been watering our gardens with for years. Maybe she was right. The kids all over the neighborhood covered themselves with mud and earthworms that day and nothing terrible happened to them. 
but that storm was almost tropical, a quick, hard, warm September rain, the edge of a hurricane that hit Mexico's Pacific coast. This is a colder winter storm. It began this morning as people were coming to church. In the choir, we sang rousing old hymns accompanied by Corey's piano playing and lighting, lightning and thunder from outside. It was wonderful. Some people missed part of the sermon though, because they went home to put out all the barrels, buckets, tubs, and pots they could find to catch the free water. Other went home to put pots and buckets inside where there were leaks in the roof. I can't remember when any of us have had a roof repaired by a professional. We all have Spanish tile roofs and that's good. A tile roof is, I suspect, more secure and lasting than wood or asphalt shingles. But time, wind, and earthquakes have taken a toll. Tree limbs have done some damage too, yet no one has extra money for anything as non-essential as roof repair. At best, some of the neighborhood men go up with whatever materials they can scavenge and create makeshift patches. No one's even done that for a while. If it only rains once every six or seven years, why bother? Our roof is all right so far and the barrels and things we put out after services this morning are full of filling full or filling, good, clean, free water from the sky, if only it came more often. Monday, March 3rd, 2025. Still raining. No thunder today, though there was some last night. Steady drizzle and occasional heavy showers all day. All day. So different and beautiful. I've never felt so overwhelmed by water. I went out and walked in the rain until I was soaked. Corey didn't want me to, but I did it anyway. It was so wonderful. How can she not understand that? It was so incredible and wonderful. Tuesday, March 4th, 2025. Amy Dunn is dead. Three years old, unloved, and dead. That doesn't seem reasonable or even possible. She could read simple words and count to 30. I taught her. She so much loved getting attention that she stuck to me during school hours and drove me crazy. Didn't want me to go to the bathroom without her. Dead. I had gotten to like her, even though she was a pest. Today, I walked her home after class. I had gotten into the habit of walking her home because the Duns wouldn't send anyone for her. She knows the way, Christmas said. Just send her over. She'll get here all right. I didn't doubt that she could have. She could look across the street and across the center island and see her house from ours, but Amy had a tendency to wander. Sent home alone, she might get there or she might wind up in the Montoya garden grazing or in the moss rabbit house trying to let the rabbits out. So I walked her across, glad for an excuse to get out in the rain again. Amy loved it too, and we lingered for a moment under the big avocado tree on the island. There was a navel orange tree at the back end of the island, and I picked a pair of ripe oranges, one for Amy and one for me. I peeled both of them, and we ate them while the rain plastered Amy's scant, colorless hair against her head and made her look bald. I took her to her door and left her in the care of her mother. You didn't have to get her so wet, Tracy complained. Might as well enjoy the rain while it lasts, I said, and I left them. I saw Tracy take Amy into the house and shut the door. Yet somehow, Amy wound up outside again, wound up near the front gate, just opposite the Garfield Balter Dory house. Jay Garfield found her there when he came out to investigate what he thought was another bundle that someone had thrown over the gate. People toss us things sometimes, gifts of envy and hate. A maggoty dead animal, a bag of shit, even an occasional severed human limb or a dead child. Dead adults have been left lying just beyond our wall, but these were all outsiders. Amy was one of us. Someone shot Amy right through the metal gate. It had to be an accidental hit because you can't see through our gate from the outside. The shooter either fired at someone who was in front of the gate or fired at the gate itself, at the neighborhood, at us, and our supposed wealth and privilege. Most bullets wouldn't have gotten through the gate it's supposed to be bulletproof, but it's been penetrated a couple times before, high up near the top. Now we have six new bullet holes in the lower portion, six holes and a seventh dent, a long smooth gauge where a bullet had glanced off without breaking through. 
We hear so much gunfire day and night, single shots and odd bursts of automatic weapons fire, even occasional blasts from heavy artillery or explosions from grenades or bigger bombs. We worry most about those last things, but they're rare. It's harder to steal big weapons and not many people around here can afford to buy the illegal ones, or that's what dad says. The thing is, we hear gunfire so much that we don't hear it. A couple of the Bader kids said they heard shooting, but as usual, they pay no attention to it. It was outside, beyond the wall, after all. Most of us heard nothing except the rain. Amy was going to turn four in a couple of weeks. I had planned to give her a little party with my kindergartners. God, I hate this place. I mean, I love it. It's home. These are my people, but I hate it. It's like an island surrounded by sharks, except that sharks don't bother you unless you go in the water but our land sharks are on their way in. It's just a matter of how long it takes for them to get hungry enough. Wednesday, March 5th, 2025. I walked in the rain again this morning. It was cold, but good. Amy has already been cremated. I wonder if her mother is relieved. She doesn't look relieved. She never liked Amy, but now she cries. I don't think she's faking. The family has spent money it could not afford to get the police involved to try to find the killer. I suspect that the only good this will do will be to chase away the people who live on the sidewalks and streets nearest to our wall. Is that good? The street poor will be back and they won't love us for sicking the cops on them. It's illegal to camp out on the street the way they do, the way they must. So the cops knock them around, rob them if they have anything worth stealing, then order them away or jail them. The miserable will be made even more miserable. None of that can help Amy. I suppose, though, that it will make the Duns feel better about the way they treated her. On Saturday, Dad will preach Amy's funeral. I wish I didn't have to be there. Funerals have never bothered me before, but this one does. You cared about Amy, Joanne Garfield said to me when I complained to her. We had lunch together t today. We ate in my bedroom because it's still raining off and on and the rest of the house was full of all the kids who hadn't gone home to eat lunch. But my room is still mine. It's the one place in the world where I can go and not be followed by anyone I don't invite in. I'm the only person I know who has a bedroom to herself. These days, even dad and Corey knock before they open my door. That's one of the best things about being the only daughter in the family. I have to kick my brothers out of here all the time, but at least I can kick them out. Joanne is an only child, but she shares a room with three younger girl cousins. Whiny Lisa, always demanding and complaining, smart giggly Robin with her near genius IQ, an invisible Jessica who whispers and stares at her feet and cries if you give her a dirty look. All three are baiters. Harry's sister and the children of Joanne's mother's sister. The two adult sisters, their husbands, their eight children, and their parents, Mr. and Mrs. Dory, are all squeezed into one five-bedroom house. It isn't the most crowded house in the neighborhood, but I'm glad I don't have to live like that. Almost no one cared about Amy, Joanne said, but you did. After the fire I did, I said, I got scared for her then. Before that, I ignored her like everyone else. So now you're feeling guilty? No. Yes, you are. I looked at her surprised. I mean it. No, I hate that she's dead and I miss her, but I didn't cause her death. I just can't deny what all this says about us. What? I felt on the verge of talking to her about things I hadn't talked about before. I had written about them. Sometimes I write to keep from going crazy. There's a world of things I don't feel free to talk to anyone about. But Joanne is a friend. She knows me better than most people and she has a brain. Why not talk to her? Sooner or later, I have to talk to someone. What's wrong, she asked. She had opened a plastic container of bean salad. Now she put it down on my night table. Don't you ever wonder if maybe Amy and Mrs. Sims are the lucky ones, I asked. I mean, don't you ever wonder what's going to happen to the rest of us? There was a clap of dull, muffled thunder and a sudden heavy shower. Radio weather reports say today's rain will be the last of the four-day series of storms. I hope not. Sure, I think about it, Joanne said, with people shooting little kids. How can I not think about it? People have been killing little kids since there have been people, I said. 
Not in here they haven't, not until now. Yes, that's it, isn't it? We got a wake up call, another one. What are you talking about? Amy was the first of us to be killed like that. She won't be the last. Joanne sighed and there was a little shudder in the side. So you think so too? I do, but I didn't know you thought about it at all. Rape, robbery, and now murder? Of course I think about it. Everyone thinks about it, everyone worries. I wish I could get out of here. Where would you go? That's it, isn't it? There's nowhere to go. There might be. Not if you don't have money. Not if all you know how to do is take care of babies and cook. I shook my head. You know much more than that. Maybe, but none of it matters. I won't be able to afford college. I won't be able to get a job or move out of my parents' house because no job, job I could get would support me and there are no self, safe places to move. Hell, my parents are still living with their parents. I know, I said, and as bad as that is, there's more. Who needs more? That's enough. She began to eat the bean salad. It looked good, but I thought I might be about to ruin it for her. There's cholera spreading in southern Mississippi and Louisiana, I said. I heard about it on the radio yesterday. There are too many poor people, illiterate, jobless, homeless, without decent sanitation or clean water. They have plenty of water down there, but a lot of it is polluted. And you know that drug that makes people want to set fires? She nodded, chewing. It's spreading again. It was on the East Coast. Now it's in Chicago. The report says that it makes watching a fire better than sex. I don't know whether the reporters are condemning it or advertising it. I drew a deep breath. Tornadoes are smashing hell out of Alabama, Kentucky, Tennessee, and two or three other states. 300 people dead so far. And there's a blizzard freezing the northern Midwest, killing even more people. In New York and Jersey, a measles epidemic is killing people. Measles. I heard about the measles, Joanne said. Strange. Even if people can't afford immunizations, measles shouldn't kill. Those people are half dead already, I told her. They've come through the winter cold, hungry, already sick with other diseases. And no, of course they can't afford immunizations. We're lucky our parents found the money to pay for all our immunizations. If we have kids, I don't see how we'll be able to do even that for them. I know, I know, she sounded almost bored. Things are bad. My mother is hoping this new guy, President Donner, will start to get us back to normal. Normal, I muttered. I wonder what that is. Do you agree with your mother? No, Donner hasn't got a chance. I think he will fix things if he could, but Harry says his ideas are scary. Harry says he'll set the country back a hundred years. My father says something like that. I'm surprised that Harry agrees. He would. His own father thinks Donner is God. Harry wouldn't agree with him on anything. I laughed, distracted, thinking about Harry's battles with his father. Neighborhood fireworks, plenty of fat flash, but no real fire. Why do you want to talk about this stuff, Joanne asked, bringing me back to the real fire. We can't do anything about it. We have to. Have to what? We're 15. What can we do? We can get ready. That's what we've got to do now. Get ready for what's going to happen. Get ready to survive it. Get ready to make a life afterward. Get focused on arranging to survive so that we can do more than just get baited around by adults about crazy, about crazy people, desperate people, thugs, and leaders who don't know what they're doing. She just stared at me. I don't know what you're talking about. I was rolling too fast, maybe. I'm talking about this place, Joe, this cul-de-sac with the wall around it. I'm talking about the day a big gang of those hungry, desperate, crazy people outside decide to come in. I'm talking about what we've got to do before that happens so that we can survive and rebuild or at least survive and escape to be something other than beggars. Someone's going to just smash in our wall and come in? More likely blast it down or blast the gate open? It's going to happen someday. You know that as well as I do. Oh, no, I don't, she protested. She sat up straight, almost stiff, her lunch forgotten for the moment. I bit into a piece of acorn bread that was full of dried fruit and nuts. It's a favorite of mine, but I managed to chew and swallow without tasting it. Joe, we're in for trouble. You've already admitted that. Sure, she said. 
more shootings, more break-ins. That's what I meant. And that's what will happen for a while. I wish I could guess how long. We'll be hit and hit and hit. Then the big hit will come. And if we're not ready for it, it will be like Jericho. She held herself rigid, rejecting. You don't know that. You can't read the future. No one can. You can, I said, if you want to. It's scary. But once you get past the fear, it's easy. In LA, some wild communities bigger and stronger than this one just aren't there anymore. Nothing left but ruins, rats, and squatters. What happened to them can happen to us. We'll die in here unless we get busy now and work out ways to survive. If you think that, why don't you tell your parents? Warn them and see what they say. I intend to. As soon as I think of a way to do it that will reach them. Besides, I think they already know. I think my father does anyway. I think most of the adults know. They don't want to know, but they do. My mother could be right about Donner. He really could do some good. No. No, Donner's just a kind of human banister. A what? I mean, he's like like a symbol of the past for us to hold on to as we're pushed into the future. He's nothing, no substance. But having him there, the latest in a two and a half century long line of American presidents, make people feel that the country, the culture that they grew up with, is still here, that we'll get through these bad times and back to normal. We could, she said. We might. I think someday we will. No, she didn't. She was too bright to take anything but the most superficial comfort from her denial. But even superficial comfort is better than none, I guess. I tried another tactic. Did you ever read about bubonic plague in medieval Europe? I asked. She nodded. She reads a lot the way I do, reads all kinds of things. A lot of the continent was depopulated, she said. Some survivors thought the world was coming to an end. Yes, but once they realized it wasn't, they also realized there was a lot of vacant land available for the taking. And if they had a trade, they realized they could demand better pay for their work. A lot of things changed for the survivors. What's your point? The changes. I thought for a moment. They were slow changes compared to anything that might happen here, but it took a plague to make some of the people realize that things could change. So things are changing now too. Our adults haven't been wiped out by a plague, so they're still anchored in the past, waiting for the good old days to come back. But things have changed a lot and they'll change more. Things are always changing. This is just one of the big jumps instead of the little step-by-step -step changes that are easier to take. People have changed the climate of the world. Now they're waiting for the old days to come back. Your father says he doesn't believe people change the climate in spite of what scientists say. He says only God could change the world in such an important way. Do you believe him? She opened her mouth, looked at me, then closed it again. After a while, she said, I don't know. My father has his blind spots, I said. He's the best person I know, but even he has blind spots. It doesn't make any difference, she said. We can't make the climate change back no matter why we changed it in the first place. You and I can't. The neighborhood can't. We can't do anything. I lost patience. Then let's kill ourselves now and be done with it, she frowned. Her round, too serious face almost angry. She tore bits of peel from a small neighbor orange. What then, she demanded. What can we do? I put the last bite of my acorn bread down and went around her to my night table. I took several books from the deep bottom drawer and showed them to her. This is what I've been doing, reading and studying these over the past few months. These books are old, like all the books in this house. I've also been using dad's computer when he lets me to get new stuff. Frowning, she looked them over. Three books on survival in the wilderness, three on guns and shooting, two each on handling medical emergencies. California native and naturalized plants and their uses, and basic living. Logging cabin building, livestock raising, plant cultivation, soap making, that kind of thing. Joanne caught on at once. What are you doing, she asked, trying to learn to live off the land? I'm trying to learn whatever I can that might help me survive out there. I think we should all study books like these. I think we should bury money and other necessities in the ground where thieves won't find them. 
I think we should make emergency packs, grab and run packs in case we have to get out of here in a hurry. Money, food, clothing, matches, a blanket. I think we should fix places outside where we can meet in case we get separated. Hell, I think a lot of things, and I know, I know that no matter how many things I think of, they won't be enough. Every time I go outside, I try to imagine what it might be like to live out there without walls, and I realize I don't know anything. Then why? I intend to survive. She just stared. I mean to learn everything I can while I can, I said. If I find myself outside, maybe what I've learned will help me live long enough to learn more. She gave me a nervous smile. You've been reading too many adventure stories, she said. I frowned. How could I reach her? This isn't a joke, Joe. What is it then? She ate the last section of her orange. What do you want me to say? I want you to be serious. I realize I don't know very much. None of us knows very much. But we can all learn more. Then we can teach one another. We can stop denying reality or hoping it will go away by magic. That's not what I'm doing. I looked out for a moment at the rain, calming myself. Okay, okay, what are you doing? She looked uncomfortable. I'm still not sure we can really do anything. Joe, tell me what I can do that won't get me in trouble or make everyone think I'm crazy. Just tell me something at last. Have you read all your family's books? Some of them, not all. They aren't all worth reading. Books aren't going to save us. Nothing is going to save us. If we don't save ourselves, we're dead. Now use your imagination. Is there anything on your family bookshelves that might help you if you are stuck outside? No. You answer too fast. Go home and look again. And like I said, use your imagination. Any kind of survival information from encyclopedias, biographies, anything that helps you learn to live off the land and defend ourselves, even some fiction might be useful. She gave me a sidelong glance. I'll bet, she said. Joe, if you never need this information, it won't do you any harm. You'll just know a little more than you did before. So what? By the way, do you take notes when you read? Guarded look. Sometimes. Read this. I handed her one of the plant books. This one was about California Indians, the plants they use and how they use them. An interesting, entertaining little book. She would be surprised. There was nothing in it to scare her or threaten her or push her. I thought I had already done that, done enough of that. Take notes, I told her. You'll remember better if you do. I still don't believe you, she said. Things don't have to be as bad as you say they are. I put the book into her hands. Hang on to your notes, I said. Pay special attention to the plants that grow between here and the coast and between here and Oregon along the coast. I've marked them. I said I don't believe you. I don't care. She looked down at the book, ran her hands over the black cloth and cardboard binding. So we learned to eat grass and live in the bushes, she muttered. We learned to survive, I said. It's a good book. Take care of it. You know how my father is about his books. Thursday, March 6, 2025. The rain stopped. My windows are on the north side of the house, and I can see the clouds breaking up. They're being blown over the mountains toward the desert. Surprising how fast they can move. The wind is strong and cold now. It might cost us a few trees. I wonder how many years it will be before we see rain again. <laughs>